right? If you're an Astros fan, you are not welcome here. No, I'm just kidding. Of course you are. We forgive you. God forgives you. But uh, it's not too late. You can still cheer for the Braves as they win the World Series. But we're going to be in the book of Galatians today. We've been in for the last couple of weeks. And if you're, if you're new to Christianity, you're not familiar with your Bible, the book of Galatians is in the New Testament or the second half of your Bible. It's a letter written from a pastor to his church. This pastor is actually sitting on death row awaiting his execution because he was preaching the gospel in a place of the world where it was illegal to do so. And so he's sitting on death row awaiting his execution, writing back to encourage this church that he helped to start. And this church is in the midst of some chaos and some turmoil. They're disagreeing about some things. They're arguing over things. And so he addresses several things from the law of God, to the grace of God, to, to so many things that we have covered. And as we get into chapter 5, there, there's a passage that has been hijacked by children's ministry. And it's the, the, the passage that discusses the fruit of the Spirit. Now, if you're, if you're familiar with your Bible or the Christian world at all or this terminology, you may have heard of the fruit of the Spirit. Again, it has been hijacked by children, and all week I've been nervous to talk about it because I know that as I even say it, you're already thinking that this is juvenile, this is junior varsity, this is so kids ministry basic. And, uh, and maybe some of you even know the song. I got, yeah, I got a nine and a six-year-old, and so I have heard the Fruit of the Spirit song over eight million times, at least. And if you're here and you don't know, yeah. Well, if, if you're like, what song? Don't Google it. Don't. It will forever live in your heart and mind. So just don't do it. If you're like, what song? Fruit of the Spirit song. You'll regret it. Don't do it. Uh, when you have kids, you'll hear it plenty of times. But, but, but it, is, it is so important for us to understand what we're, what we're talking about. And the title of my message is Five Facts About Fruit. How creative is that, man? You're welcome. And not real fruit either. I'm not talking like, there are 37, 37 different types of apples. That's not what I mean. But like, but like there, there are so many things to pull from this passage the author gives us. And we have come to call, nickname, the fruit of the Spirit. And so we're going to walk through the passage together, pull out five really simple yet powerful truths. And then we're going to go get some candy. Can I get an amen? Come on, somebody. Yeah. Listen, I, I know, yeah, I mean, if, if you came just for candy, you're like, this, I thought we were going to get candy. We will chill. We're not going to be here long, you know. We're going to go get candy. And uh, I, I, I made a mistake in the first service. They're mad at me because I was out at my car, and I was giving out like a half a bucket of candy to each kid, man. I was just like, I ran out of candy. That's my fault. But I, I got more. I'll make a Publix run or something. We'll, we'll figure it out. Five facts about fruit, Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, they're obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. You already got the song in your head, don't you? Y'all are singing it in your head, I know. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we live by the spirit let us also keep in step with the spirit let us not become conceited provoking one another or envying one another here's the first thing I want us to understand together kind of the foundation of our time together that the Holy Spirit when we're talking about the Holy Spirit we're not talking about an it or an energy or a force we're talking about a he, and that he is God. And it's so important because there are Christians, uh, even entire denominations, who speak about the Holy Spirit like it's a thing. Like it's, a, it's some kind of energy or a force, something that you can catch and then give up, or like 
like find and then enjoy for a second and then it's gone. And like, it's just like this weird, mythical, ethereal idea or concept or something that kind of sort of exists in the spiritual realm. And, and it's often referred to as an it or, or an energy or a force, like a thing. But when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, hear me, we're talking about someone, not something. Someone, and that someone that we're talking about is God. We're going to take a quick trip through seminary real quick. I didn't even go to seminary. Some of you know that. You're like, you didn't go to seminary. I know, I didn't. But it's going to feel like a seminary class for like 90 seconds, then we'll come right back, I promise, okay? So turn your thinking brains on, because we're going to get a little, little serious about theology for a second, but then we'll come right back, you know. And so here's what we need to understand about the God that we worship. The God that we worship, the biblical God that's revealed in Scripture, we describe as triune in nature, or you may have heard verbiage like the Trinity. That we believe as Christians that there is one God. There is one God. We do not worship many gods. We worship one God. And that one being of God is shared by three co-eternal, co-sovereign, and co-perfect persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all of whom are perfectly and truly and completely God. One being of God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, we, you and I, are human beings, right? And so I'm a human being, and my being is shared by one person, and his name is David. Nice to meet you. But if I had more than one person in my being... That would be a disorder. You'd put me in one of those funny hospitals with padded walls. I'd get a jacket where I hug myself all day, and you'd visit me through the glass. Because if I had more than one person in my being, that's a disorder. I have one person in my being. God is in a category in and of himself, one being of God, shared by three co-eternal, co-sovereign, co-perfect persons, all of whom, each of whom are perfectly and truly God. The Father the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit of God. Again, a he and not an it. So when we talk about these things that we're about to talk about, you have to understand that when I'm describing the Holy Spirit's work in your life, I'm not talking about something that's, that's just kind of there and present in the spiritual realm, but it's hard to kind of locate or define or describe. I'm talking about someone, God. Like, it is so, maybe you came here today, and you're crossing your fingers hoping you get a good take of Reese's Pieces peanut butter cups, and I'm, me too, man, me too, I'm there. But you need to know that God, like the one true and eternal God, has, has come to this earth, lived without sin, died the death you should have died, rose again, so that by his grace, you might be reconciled to him and have a relationship with him forever, and you must Hear me if you hear nothing else, that when I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about a thing. I'm talking about a, a person. I'm talking about a he, and that is God. Here's number two I want you to catch. That it's not about what you do for God, but what God does through you. Now hear me. So we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. What are we talking about, Pastor? We're talking about, maybe, don't point fingers, don't name names, just... But you ever met that Christian that says all the Christian stuff, but their life shows no evidence that they truly love Jesus? You ever met that person? Again, don't point fingers. Maybe you're sitting next to him. Don't do that. Just keep to yourself, man. But you've met the brother or the sister that's like, they're all about Jesus. Their Facebook says they're all about Jesus. They might even have like the cross as their profile picture, man. And you gotta be varsity to do that, you know. Every picture they post Jesus t-shirt, Bible open, Bible verse has the caption. They are all in. No matter what's going on, you ask them how they're doing, they say blessed. You ask them to quote John 3.16, they don't even have to look. They know it. Everything they say seems to show that they love Jesus. But when you're looking at evidence in their life, like what are they what are they doing to demonstrate this proclamation of love that they have for Jesus? And the evidence is just not really there. When we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, what we're talking about is a demonstration of or the evidence for your love and affection for Jesus Christ. So many Christians get caught up in, they become fixated upon, they become focused on what they do for God. 
But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this is something that God does through you. And these two things are altogether different. So think about it. If you, if you approach the Christian life with, what am I doing for God? What can I do for God? What am I going to accomplish for God? I just want you to know that that might seem innocent, but it can lead to very dark places because here's where that leads sometimes. That can start with, what am I going to do for God? But it can end up with, man, you know what? Look at all that I've done for God. He ought to be thankful I'm on his team. Now, I've never heard anybody say that, but I've met some brothers who pretty much believe that, man. Like, they walk around, they operate in their life like, God better thank me that I'm on his team. How about this? You ever seen somebody who gets in a place, maybe, maybe you're this person, and I love you, but maybe you're this person, you get there sometimes where you kind of think that God owes you? Like, if you look at all that I do for God, then you, you pray to God, you ask him for something, he doesn't deliver the way that you think he should have delivered, he doesn't answer the way you think he should have answered, because after all, you know you're smarter than God, you know. And so you ask him for something, he doesn't, you know, do it exactly the way that you would have done it if you were God, and then you get upset and frustrated, and this, this thing can kind of rise up in you sometimes. It's, it's happened to me, man. It'll rise up in me so fast, like, God, wh why would you do this? Why wouldn't you do this? Look at all that I've done, and I appeal to my morality. And this is so, so dangerous. And it starts with, what am I going to do for God? But do you hear the difference in these two statements? It's not about what you do for God. It's about what God does through you. Because you see in one scenario, what you do for God, that sounds a lot like you're going to get all the attention and the glory. But if it's something that God does, then he gets the glory. And that's really, really good news. If it's something that God does, then he gets all the attention. If it's something that God does, then you're simply operating in what we call grace, which is what you don't deserve. Amen? That's what grace is. It's something that we don't deserve that we're not worthy of. So I'll pick on me. I've picked on y'all enough. So I'm just going to pick on me. But when I think about like planting this church and pastoring this church, there are two ways that I can look at it. And in my weak moments, I look at it this way. This is what I'm doing for God. This is what I do. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm going to do for God. Now, to be sure, I want everything that I do and say to be motivated by the glory of God, and I want to be compelled by the love of Jesus Christ. But if I look at it like this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm accomplishing, this is what I'm building, this is what I'm executing, the problem is that involves a lot of me, and I'm not that impressive, man. Like, and if you attach your hope to me, you got big problems. My hope isn't even attached to me, so don't attach your hope to me. But if, but if I can rely on the Holy Spirit to remember that it's not about what I'm doing or accomplishing, but about what God is doing and what God is accomplishing. So it is not that I'm doing all this and planting a church and, and, and leading a church and all that, and God's in heaven crossing his fingers, cheering me on, hoping it works out, but rather that God for his glory, wants to see people in Pasco County come to know Jesus. Come on, somebody. Like, he wants to see people hear the gospel, respond to the gospel, follow Jesus, so that their eternity might be forever changed. And if it's something that God is doing, then my role is I get to be what the Bible calls a witness. Basically, that I'm just watching this happen. I'm along for the ride, operating in his grace. I can't believe I even get to be a part of it. But do you see the difference? It's either about what you do or what God does. And if it's what God does, then you realize that everything that happens to you or through you is all because of God's grace. And that causes us, as the people of God, to thank him and praise him and worship him all the more. So today, maybe you're focused upon what you do for God. And maybe today, by the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God, you might be free from that. And realize that everything that you're involved in, everything that you do, everything that you accomplish is all God doing it through you. I try to train up our staff in this, our volunteers, everyone who calls 12 Church our home. Make no mistake, God's doing something here. And we get to be a part of it. And so I'll say things so often to people like, stay out of his way. Right? Like, like when I'm in conversations with people, I'm just like, look, man, I'm just trying to stay out of the way because God's doing something and it isn't up to me or dependent upon me but this is God doing it through me so all these things that we mentioned and we'll get there in just a moment all of these these manifestations of or demonstrations of or evidences for 
the Holy Spirit in our lives. All of those things are produced by the Holy Spirit, not by us. Here's number three. This is one of those things like, I don't know. It's like, you ever hear somebody say something that's like nails on a chalkboard? You're like, yeah. You know, there's two things. One, when people say revelations to describe the last book of the Bible, it's revelation. I'm not going to fight you on it. I'm not going to embarrass you. But when someone says revelations, my Bible college students know, you know, revelations. You're like, ugh, ugh it's revelation, singular revelation, whatever. This is another one where when people say fruits of the spirit, I'm, I just, I just, I'm like, I'm, I'm not mad about it. I'm just saying, like, I, I so badly want to just stop and preach. Can I preach for a second? Is that okay? It's in the Bible. The original language is Greek. The word given to us in this passage here is the Greek word for fruit, singular word fruit. And now we have a list of things, a, 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 a multitude of ways that this fruit is demonstrated or, or the, the evidence is seen. And, and if you look closely at these things, this list that, uh, the Bible gives us of the fruit of the Spirit, you see that they're almost practically essentially synonymous. That, that really, when you look at this list of things, it's really hard to say, oh yeah, yeah, I, I, I got that one, but I don't have this one. Or I, I'm really good at one, three, and five, but two, four, and six, I'm like, I'm not. And, and here's how I would explain it. Like, like, how could you possibly, how could you possibly have one or half or any of these without seeing a demonstration of all of them. Imagine this. Imagine I were to be describing somebody to you and I would be like, that guy? Let me tell you something about that guy. He is the most loving person that I've ever met. So full of love, but no joy. Just a miserable person, you know? Loving, boy, he lo so loving, no joy. Or if I were to be like, you know, Want me to describe her to you? No, I'll describe her to you. She is so kind. Kindness. When I think kindness, bam, her face. That's what I see. Kind. But I'll tell you what. You say the wrong thing around her, she will blow up in your face. No patience, you know. It's really hard to say that you've got A, B, C, or, or, or you've got one, two, and three, but you don't have the rest because what the Bible is essentially telling us is all of these things are almost, if you will, so intertwined and connected, it's as though they were one thing. And what you're seeing when you see the evidence of the Holy Spirit in someone's life, we're not talking about a supernatural gift, we're not talking about any sort of uh, skill or anything, what we're talking about are these things being demonstrated in the person's life and, and what can happen is we, when we begin to isolate them and we get to pull them out, what we're forgetting when we do that is that these are things given to us by the Holy Spirit of God and they are actually the Holy Spirit of God working in and through us. And if you forget, here's what happens. You experience counterfeit versions of these things. So I've met people that are not Christians and they are very loving but a lot of times their love is rooted in selfishness or pride or reciprocity with another person. Or you see people that seem to have a lot of joy. Again, they don't have the Holy Spirit. They have this, it seems like on the surface, it seems like joy. But what that is, is happiness. You want to know the difference? Their happiness is dependent upon what happens to them. And if things are happening the way that they want them to happen, they have happiness. If things don't happen the way that they want to happen, then they don't have happiness. But joy is something different, rooted in Christ and what he has done, not on what happens to us. You see, the Holy Spirit gives us these things, and we see these things so clearly when we understand that the Holy Spirit is the one operating in us and through us to accomplish these things. But when we remove the Holy Spirit from the equation and we begin to isolate these individual things, what can happen is we begin experiencing counterfeits of these things. And I don't want you to settle today for a counterfeit. I want you to experience the fullness of all that God has for you in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, remember, we're talking about a he, not an it, not a force, not an idea, not an energy. We're talking about a he, a person. And, and it's been said before that, that as the people of God, it's not that we simply have access to God's attention, but we have the power of his presence. And you need to know today that there is a living God 
And today, you can be reconciled to him and be in relationship with him. Maybe you've never heard that before. More on that in just a moment. Here's number four. These things are not possible apart from the person and work of God. So maybe, maybe you're here and you're like, man, I don't, man, I don't love, nope. Joy, certainly not. Peace, I don't even know really, man, how I could, I've never had peace in my life. I'm not a patient person. Kindness is not, gentleness, no way. I have no self-control. And, you're, and the problem is, is that if you look at these things like disciplinary behaviors, what's going to happen is, is you're going you're gonna to just sort of try your best and, and, and try to adopt some good habits and just get some white knuckle discipline and try to be the best person that you could ever be. And the problem with that is, is that you are, you are trying to do what cannot be done. You are trying to earn your way into heaven or earn your righteousness before God. And it's a losing game because it's impossible. That's not even how it works. And so you have to understand that for any of these things to be truly evident in your life, that there is, a, there is a necessity for you to come into relationship with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit then dwells in you, which is a unique and distinctive way of seeing the world. It is unique to Christianity that the Holy Spirit dwells in you and you begin to operate in a kind of power that you don't have in your flesh. You begin to operate in a kind of power that you didn't even know was possible because it isn't yours it's the Holy Spirit working in you and through you. But none of these things are possible apart from the person and work of God. Here's number five. Again, five facts about fruit. Here's number five. It's not about behaving. It's about belonging. This is so key. It'll change your life. This is going to change your life. I believe so strongly. I believe so strongly there's somebody here today. And this is exactly what you needed to hear. Can we go back... Uh, I think it's verse, yeah, it's 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus. Man, if you've got a Bible at home, I want you to go home, find it, open to Galatians 5, 24. I want you to circle, underline, highlight, put a box around, put arrows pointing to this word, belong. This is so rare. It is so rare that Christians truly grab hold of this. And I see so often Christians operating in this behavior kind of mentality as though being a Christian is about being a good person. It's about behaving and doing the right things. Some of you have never even, have never even considered becoming a Christian, but you've done this thing, you've lived your life where you try to be just moral enough that if there is a God, he won't have a problem with you. And I understand that mentality really well because I spent the first 17 years of my life in that mentality. I'm just going to be a good person. I don't know, God, Jesus, whatever. But I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to try really hard. If I ever mess up, well, then I'll just do good things and I'll kind of, you know, I'll kind of, you know, tip the scales in my favor, you know. And we live our lives like as though there are scales. Like when you're good, you get a jelly bean. And when you're bad, you know, the jelly bean goes on the other side. And as long as you're, yeah, you're somewhere, listen, the scales don't even exist, man. You can be free from that don't even exist. But we live our life in that way, that mentality. And listen, I've been there. I was trapped in it for 17 years. I get it. But being a Christian isn't about behaving. It's about belonging. And, and, and if you will today, and as often as you have to, maybe it's several times a day from now until glory. Maybe it's every morning when you wake up. Maybe it's every night before you go to bed and every hour on the hour in between. If you'll remind yourself that you belong to Jesus. I promise you, I promise you, this will bring about a kind of, of power in your life and a kind of peace in your life that you did not even know was possible because up until now, you've been operating in a behavior mindset. This is what I've got to do. This is who I've got to be. I've got to be strong enough, good enough, smart enough, moral enough, religious enough. I've got to do enough of this. And listen to me, that's slavery. But there is real freedom found in belonging to Jesus Christ. You know how this is going to change your marriage? Oh man, gentlemen. Like if you'll, if you'll remind yourself, man, I belong to Jesus. You know what that means? That means your identity is not wrapped up in your spouse. 
That means your identity isn't wrapped up in your relationship with your kids. That means your, your identity is not wrapped up in your job or your salary or your, the, the amount of money in your bank account or what you've accomplished or haven't accomplished. Like it frees you up from all of those things and you realize that I belong to Jesus. This is the anthem of a Christian, that I belong to Jesus. And if you live your life in this way, this behavior mentality, this is what I have to do. I believe that over the next few moments, God's gonna do something so special in your heart and mind because I believe that all week I've been praying, not even knowing who you were, but praying for you. And over these next few moments, I want you to hear I want you to hear this reality. Maybe it's something you've heard before, but you never actually heard, like you've heard it, but you haven't heard it. Or maybe it's possible you've never heard it in your life. But if you're here and you're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do everything I can. I'm gonna be a good person. And then at the end of it, if I'm good enough, then I'll, I'll, I'll be with God if there is one. And you need to know. I say this every week and I'll say it every week that I have breath in my lungs for as long as I live by the grace of God. Listen to me. All of the work necessary to bring you to God, it's already been done, man. Listen, everything that had to be done has already been done. There's nothing left to do. When Jesus hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. It's done. All of the work necessary to bring you to God has already been done by Jesus. What needed to be accomplished has already been accomplished. The reality is that there is one God who's good and he's holy and he's perfect. But by nature and choice, you and I are sinners, which means we are rebels against God. Listen, we're not mistake makers. We're not really good people who are trying really hard, but you know, just once in a while we make mistakes. Listen to me, we are sinners in active and glad rebellion against God. And we deserve his wrath upon us. We deserve punishment for breaking the law of God, that law of God, which is a perfect reflection of the perfect nature of God. And we violated his law and violated him and we run from him in rebellion and deserve to die alone in our sins. But let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus, who was God himself, came from heaven to earth. He wrapped himself in flesh and he lived a perfect and sinless life. Jesus obeyed perfectly, never sinned, perfectly upheld and fulfilled the entire law and never sinned. But when he died on the cross, he died as though he were a guilty criminal and he suffered under the holy wrath of God. And maybe you're like, wait, I missed something. Hold on, pause. Didn't you just say he was perfect, innocent, never sinned? Now you're saying he dies condemned as a guilty man, as a sinner? He dies as though he were guilty of sin under the wrath of God? How does that work? Listen, you may have heard before that Jesus died for you and you have no idea what that means. Listen to me. Jesus died instead of you. Come on, somebody. Jesus died instead of you. This is so important to understand that at the cross, they nailed him by his hands and his feet. He bled out, suffering under the wrath of God above his head, a sign that read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. You know what it should have said? This is where David Rodavio belongs. That was my cross to die on. That was your cross to die on. And he stood and he hung and he died in your place and for your sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and on the third day, maybe you already know this, but on the third day, he physically and he victoriously resurrected from the dead, proving his perfect power and dominion over sin, death, hell, and the grave. And so watch this. It's by your faith and not your works. The work's already been done, man. It's by your faith that you can be forgiven of all of your sin and reconciled to God forever. And I know what just happened in somebody's mind, whether you're here or you're watching online. I just said you can be forgiven of all of your sin and you went, nope, I call bull. No way. There's no way you can say that, pastor. You have no idea what I've been through. You have no idea what I've been involved in. You have no idea what I'm addicted to. You have no idea what I struggle with. You have no idea how dark my mind and my actions and my life has been. You could never say, if you knew what I've been through, you could never say I could be forgiven by God. And here's, here's how I know it's true without having to know you. If your sin was too powerful for God, Jesus would still be dead. Yeah. Did you know that? Like, like if your sin was just too much for God to handle, like you were just way too skilled of a sinner, then Jesus would still be dead. 
But good news, God is way better at saving than you even are at sinning. And when he rose from the dead, he showed his perfect power over your sin that it is no longer a threat. It is done, it is dead, it is buried, and Jesus is alive. And so today, today, you believe. It's not about signing up for a religion, being a good person, being more moral, following a list of rules. No, 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 be free from that. It's not by our works. The work's been done. It's by your faith in Jesus Christ. You can be forgiven. Your relationship to this perfect and holy God can be reconciled, and you can be adopted into the family of God as a son or daughter in Christ, and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. And this is a miraculous thing and available for you today. So over the next few moments, would you do me a favor, just bow your heads and close your eyes as we close our time together. I want to pray for you. Lord Jesus, I, I thank you for the time that we have had, and I pray for my brother or sister in, the, in, the, in this place right now who is just, their whole life, they have missed this gospel. But today, by the power of your Holy Spirit, something clicked. They get it. They understand it. They're ready. And they understand that all of the work to bring them to you has already been done. And may they today place their trust in you for forgiveness so that they might be reconciled to you. May today be the day of salvation. Lord Jesus, I pray that if there's anyone within the sound of my voice, whether here or watching online, and they're ready, but they question, they're not sure, they're uncertain, that they would that they would do something, they would say something, they would find one of us, they, would, they, 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 they wouldn't they would leave this place, they wouldn't leave this campus today without being sure that they are in relationship with you. God, may today be the day of salvation. And may your Holy Spirit fall upon them in a powerful and evident way so that they understand who you are and all that you have done. May you be glorified in it and through it. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Hey.